Hello once again, this is Professor Lusheen. This is Lecture 21 for Safety 380, Introduction to Occupational Safety and Health. We are now transitioning into the fifth and final module for this course. Uh, we're going to be covering uh, today health standards and hazard communication, uh, and then we'll be getting into industrial hygiene, talking about it from an epidemiological, tox toxicological perspective. Uh, we'll get into hearing conservation and uh, respiratory protection, and then behavioral-based safety concepts. After that, it's just sort of a semester overview. So congratulations on getting to this point. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, and those of you who have been uh, yearning for more of a health side of the OSH, you're now going to uh, get yours. So the objectives, I'm gonna kind of give you a very broad overview of these topics, introduce you to the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. And uh, I need you to read chapter 12 from the administration and programs textbook. Then of course, look at the study sheet and prep for the quiz. So what is health related? I mean, the way we sort of design it uh, or uh, view it is that it tends to be more of the, uh, like the chemicals or the hazardous materials or contents of a product. Uh, harmful physical agents are noise, heat, cold, uh, vibration, um, radiation. Biological agents would be anything from viral, bacterial, parasitic agents, any vector-borne um, diseases. Uh, ergonomic factors are pretty general. We talked about those with overexertion. And then coming up with control methodologies, with con which are tend to be a little bit trickier than the uh, safety. Safety, you know, you've got designing things out, whereas health-related, uh, it takes a little bit more finesse um, to find acceptable safety practices. In addition to safety, this health side, on uh, the next lecture I'll be talking about industrial hygiene, uh, you need to be have more background in the, the STEM courses, the STEM coursework, biology, chemistry, physics, tox, things like that. Uh, here are the different OSHA standard subparts that touch on or relate to health related. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll look primarily at the, um, the part, a part Z that has the permissible exposure limits, um, bloodborne pathogens, hazard communication, lab safety, and some others. There are some standards under subpart G. Uh, 94 is uh, the hearing conservation standard, 95. No, 95 is the hearing conservation standard. Um, 94 is ventilation. Uh, and then they also have the radiation standards in that group. Hazardous materials, everything from compressed gases up to and including flammable liquids, uh, spray operations, um, process safety management, and um, HAZWOPER, with it, which is hazardous waste operations and emergency response. Under K, uh, 151, they've got you know first aid, eye wash stations, emergency uh, emergency washes, and uh, emergency showers. <laughs> and then under J. We've got a variety of things, uh, environment, or I should say uh, sanitation standards, and a few other things relating to health. Uh, what's interesting, I think, is that although OSHA does regularly update their national emphasis programs, I just pulled this moments ago, is that five of the ten relate to health-related. So hexavalent chromium, that is a component of metals. Um, you can also find it in waste streams, You know, if you've ever seen the movie Aaron Brockovich. Lead is also in metal products, and you also find it in things like paint. Um, so there are exposures to that, either in welding or uh, demolition work or modeling work. There are some um, elements within the primary metal industries that are chemical related, but it's also um, safety issues relating to working with metals. Crystalline silica. Uh, silica is a common component in sand. Uh, so whenever you see somebody doing cutting of uh, concrete blocks or into concrete itself um, and forming a very fine dust, that's, that's hazardous. I'm surprised I don't see asbestos on here. That must have just come off. I think they replaced it with coronavirus because um, right now that is the hot topic at OSHA. Uh, OSHA has been directed by the Biden administration to promulgate a, an emergency temporary standard. Uh, so uh, it, that's going to be coming around or is coming around right now. 
OSHA has from the beginning had a um, a page dedicated to coronavirus. Uh, and then, it, but I think uh, most businesses. I mean, I've been. I was on the campus response team, or the I should say the emergency operations committee. Uh, we were referring to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention website, and then also our local um, health departments. That's where we were primarily getting our information, not so much from OSHA. Just the other day, by the other day I mean yesterday, uh, the CDC came out with a preliminary report on their 2020 mort uh, mortality, and in the U.S., COVID-19 related death ranked third which means they actually increased overall U.S. deaths by almost 16%. So in 2020, this is all preliminary, uh, but age-adjusted death rate increased by almost 16% just due to the pandemic. Um, I mean, there's going to have to be more research there, but um, the numbers are a lot higher, which is interesting because less people were working, so the work-related stuff was out, uh, but it, it, we'll, we'll see how the, um, the other primary cause, heart disease and cancer, how those um, may have changed also due to access to health care, things like that. Interesting stuff going on right now. Uh, I'll also speak real briefly on the bloodborne pathogen standard. Right now, it's getting more attention because of vaccination clinics. You know, when people are vaccinated, as soon as a needle penetrates someone's uh, dermal layer, it is, you know, that needle is now considered a bloodborne pathogen hazard. And so whoever is administering the vaccine has to be very careful not to accidentally stick themselves or put it in a place in which someone else could have um, stick themselves. And so that's going to be a really big deal. Uh, but bloodborne pathogens are always a concern, especially in, in healthcare settings, because it, yeah, needle stick is front and center here. But um, the idea is, with bloodborne pathogens is you practice universal precautions. And when COVID first came out and people started asking me for um, advice, that's what I used as a guide. Assume everyone is sick or assume that all bodily fluids are infected with a, a viral agent and therefore protect yourself. You know, wear the proper PPE, use proper uh, sanitizing cleaning protocols. Uh, make sure all waste is, is is controlled, labeled, and properly handled. All these sorts of things. And then, yeah, they talk about engineering controls and exposure control plans. So my initial exposure control plan for the university was predicated on universal precautions, which come from the bloodborne pathogen standard. Let's shift gears from the biological to the chemical. HASCOM, which is short for Hazard Communication Standard. Uh, some people call it the employee chemical right to know is it what it does it essentially requires employers to collect well I'll, I'll take two sides of this one side is employers must collect all safety data sheets for every product or chemical that any worker or that any you know that any worker may handle on site so they can be educated on what are the potential dangers if they get it on their skin breathe it or if it gets splashed in their eyes they possibly ingest it, but more importantly, how to read the labels as well and act accordingly. And so this is a, if you recall, this is the number two most frequently cited standard. Uh, it's number one for general industry because a lot of companies don't really understand it. They just think, well, if I have a binder of the data sheets that manufacturers send along, then I'll be okay. But what if you go buy it from like a Home Depot or Menards or Lowe's? You have, to, you have to acquire those. I'm going to show you how to do that. I'm also going to explain to you how to create a program that exceeds OSHA's standards. Uh, the other side of it is if you're a chemical manufacturer, distributor, you have to make... So if you're a chemical manufacturer, you actually have to create the, the safety data sheet. And there are protocols on how to do that, especially since... Uh, it's For me, it's not too long ago, but for a lot of people, it's always been there, is that... Uh, OSHA adopted something called globalized harmonization for their safety data sheets because they used to be called material safety data sheets. Now they just call them safety data sheets and now they have to have um, 
the safety data sheets themselves have to have 16 sections that meet certain basic protocols. The warning system is now standardized internationally, and there is the adoption of pictograms. Um, so that you don't have to speak the language, but you know what the ha basic hazards are. But there is a, an abundance of information on the OSHA website pertaining to this particular issue. So it's about informing. People know what they're working with, what's possibly in it, and therefore where they can get either additional information or how to respond in case of an emergency. And it also is the, the basis for the selection of proper personal protective equipment that may be required if you can't engineer out the exposure. So you see here in the standards here, they have hazard determination under D, also Appendix B. Uh, they have um, writ the written program requirements, the labeling warnings requirements, the safety data sheet requirements under GHS, and then employee information and training requirements and trade secret protection. Sometimes you'll walk through a workplace and they'll have something like what you see up here on the right. Um, that first square there that says NFPA. Um, there's also a, a version called HMIS, Hazard Material Information System, which was the old way they did it before GHS, but now we've got the pictograms. And you'll see things posted on the walls and stuff like that in workplaces. So to the right, you see the pictograms. I'm not going to make you memorize. Oh, maybe I do. We'll have to look on the study sheets to see if I still do that. But I think they're fairly obvious, at least most of them. Um, about the only one that I don't think is that obvious is the health hazard, which is kind of interesting because it kind of looks like Starman, which was a wrestling dude on the really old Nintendo um, gaming system. When I was in college, we used to play it, and we always used to be Starman because he did this backflip, and that's what he kind of looked like. Weird. Uh, I know the difference between um, the flame over circle is oxidizers, the flame itself is flammable, skull and crossbones are what they call the Jolly Roger, I think. Acute cost toxicity. I mean, I, I think they're kind of all pretty straightforward. The other issue with this new system is the flipping of the severity. So what I and a lot of people my age are used to is when you have a rating of four, be afraid. Um, four is the highest. That means it's the most hazardous. Now they flipped it. For now safety data sheets, a one is the most severe. But fortunately... Uh, for us old timers, um, they usually publish both. That, you know, the HMIS is a four, S, and under GHS it's a one. And you'll see that. <sighs> under the OSH Act, money was set aside for the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. As I had mentioned previously, they were, they tend to be my main source for information when it comes to health related or any sort of safety and health research. Uh, they have good, I mean, they've got, they're down in the, based out of Atlanta. Um, they publish a lot of things. So between NIOSH and um, CDC and um, uh, the World Health Organization, that's where I get a lot of my information. Now, when we get industrial hygiene, there'll be work-specific related things, some other agencies I'll talk about, but uh, NIOSH is a fantastic source. I still use the NIOSH Pocket Guide to look up chemical hazards. Uh, and there's all kinds of stuff you can get them for, for, get free from them. So definitely check them out. So here's how you create a an OSHA compliant hazardous communication system. First, you must create a hazardous material inventory. Uh, typically, in like my other classes, my higher cl level classes, I get my students real world um, safety projects to work on, and unequivocally. Has, has come is usually one of those because people don't know how to do it. They're worried about it. So what I have my students do is a visual audit. Find all things that contain a hazardous material and take a picture of it. And then go to the uh, and, and start creating a, an Excel spreadsheet with what you found. You know, the, the name of the company that produces it, what's the, what's the name of the, the product typically. On the label itself, what, what can you find out? size of it, things like that. And then you look through the employer's binders of material safety data sheets, old version or SDSs, safety data sheets, and you try to match everything up. What do they have? What are they missing? Acquire that which is missing or outdated uh, from online. And I'm going to show you how to do that in just a moment. And then you just, you, you kind of work out what is there, what is the quantities and everything like that. So you have a sortable spreadsheet 
um, by product, by location, by how it's stored, the, the capacities it's stored, what are the has. So you, you have the ability to really tease out what we have here, how much we have, what are the exposures, and then you work all the way to how are we mitigating those exposures? How are we protecting our workers? So the, the hazardous material inventory becomes the resource for developing not only um, the uh, part of evaluating what sort of PPE we need and why, so how are we protecting them, but also then the basis for the training. And you may also find that maybe there is a better way to store things. Boom, you click that off your list of things to do. You may find that there are some hazard materials that need to be hauled out of here. You always do when you do these, uh, these audits. Um, good, now those are gone. Um, and so <laughs> the process of understanding what is out there, what do we have, what are the exposures, um, cleaning things up, storing them properly, labeling them properly, all that effort leads up to a solid HASCOM program. Believe me, I've done it many, many times. It's very labor intensive, but um, once you get it in place, it's really easy to manage, especially if it's in an Excel. Now, if you're working for a company, why do I always say now as a transition word? I don't know. If you're working for a company and you just don't have the time to do that, there are there's a growing number of um, HASCOM management systems out there that you can purchase, purchase like a um, subscription. And then you have um, access to their internet. Everything is stored there. Then you just have to train workers how to get in and access things. Let's see. Did I cover everything? I pretty much did. Oh, I just want to remind you of the hazard control hierarchy, um, that that should be applied to health-related things and HASCOM, just like it did to safety things. And then make sure workers understand what they're working with, um, what they need to do in order to protect themselves, how to recognize when either the PPE is damaged or... Um, not operating properly or symptoms of possible exposure, then how to react. Okay, so before I get into this stuff, what I'd like to do, and I think you'll find this fun. So I, I went out to, um, you know, everybody has a cabinet where they keep cleaning chemicals and other stuff. I pulled just three things that are right off the shelf, and I looked at the labels. And I really didn't see anything that met Global Harmonized System or GHS. So I did my own little search. So um, so I just want to, you know, here's the review of things, blah, 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 read chapter 12, visit the websites and everything that I post for you. So check this out. So the first thing I pulled was a, uh, a little glue bottle. You guys may have something like this. It's Gorilla Clear Glue. And I also noticed if you pull back the flap in microfiche, they've got information about health. I can barely read that even with my cheaters on. So I went to Google and I searched Gorilla Clear Glue SDS, and this is what I found. So let's so look at here. So section one is identification. Uh, it talks a little bit about what it looks like, what it's used for, where the company's located, their emergency telephone number, their website. Now section two, hazardous identification. So what's in here? Well, it's an eye damage, eye skin sensitivity. I'm sorry, one skin sensitivity one. Um, and so it's got the two pictograms for corrosivity and irritant. Um, so there's danger, allergic reaction. Remember, in SDS version, this, a one is the worst. That's the, the most hazardous. Uh, let's see, precautionary, avoid breathing vapors. So I'm reading that this is something that I don't want to get on my skin. I don't want to get in my eyes. I should avoid breathing it. But... I mean, it, it, it looks like the, the sort of warnings you'd see like on a piece of candy or something. So, you know, no wonder that, that not too long ago, some lady put this stuff in her hair because she ran out of hairspray. Remember, she had to get it surgically removed. I think they need to be a little, you know, something, something to give us a little bit more of a warning. And then if you scroll through, we can go to the other sections. What's in it? Can't even pronounce these. Pretty rough stuff. This stuff is supposed to cure fast and hold hard. So first aid measures, firefighting things, accidental release measures, handling and storage, exposure controls. It talks about this. Uh, I don't see any US things. Proper PPE, physical chemical properties, not a lot there. Stability and reactivity. Avoid direct sunlight. <laughs> 
nowhere on here does it say store in a dark place. Uh, it's got uh, toxicological information, which we'll cover in the next lecture. We'll discuss that. Yeah, transportation information, disposal considerations, you know, to see your local requirements, and other regulatory information. Look at all this information that's here, and yet I wouldn't get that sort of alert if I had just looked at it. Uh, let's look at the next one. Uh, do you guys ever clean you know, in the bathroom? This is really good for like cleaning tubs and toilets, um, anything you really, it's got bleach in it too. And looking at, it's actually really hard to read because of the shiny background, so the contrast is really poor. Kind of tells me where to use it, what can be used on, how to use it. Uh, store in a cool, dry place. Uh, precautions can cause eye irritation. Avoid contact with eyes and clothing. Wash thoroughly with soap. So nothing will be a real big deal, right? All right, let's find it. So I found it here. Let's see what sort of dangers. So it has the corrosive. It has a category one. Oh wait, sorry, R I is a, is a 2B. I don't know that there was a letter associated with it. Corrosive to metals is a one. May cause eye irritation, but it's corrosive to metals. It gives us a little information. So it's got a sulfuric acid ester, ester in it. So, I mean, this stuff could do you a little bit of damage. You know, one time, uh, when I was working for OSHA as an industrial hygienist, um, I know the smell of things, of certain chemicals. And I was, I was it was a two-story duplex. I was living with a few buddies from college, and I could smell chlorine gas. Shouldn't have chlorine gas in the house, right? So I ran downstairs, and my roommate, for the first time, was trying to clean the bathroom, so good for him. But what he did is... He took Comet and kind of sprayed it you know, all over the shower bath thing. And then he took a tile cleaner, an acidic tile cleaner, and sprayed it. And that reacted and created chlorine gas. And so what we did is turn on the, um, the bathroom fan. I got him outside because he was feeling ill. He was not feeling His eyes were watering and everything. Um, I just sort of monitored him. It was, it, was just, it was a real quick minor thing. The door had already been opened. So closed it, vented. And I also turned on the shower so it would wash it down. Um, so yeah, I mean, these over the counter, you know, Home Depot, Menards, Lowell cleaning chemicals, if combined, um, can actually, yeah, it can cause some serious harm to people. So the last one I looked at, so this one would be a little bit more, you know, along the lines of something would be a little bit more severe, you would think, although there is a big warning right there, um, is CLR. And I use this for um, removing a uh, lime scale from, you know, sinks, faucets, things like that, because we've got a, a, we've got heavy water here. And so, let's see. So it's got a warning sign. Don't get it in your eye. Don't get it on your skin. I do know that when I work with it, I I kind of feel it on my skin a little bit, but I do wash my hands and I try to be as careful. And I try to use it in more of a diluted state. So it's got uh, two an acid and an oxide in it. Not real high percentages. It says what to do. You know, if you inhale it, eye contact. What if you ingest it? Do not induce vomiting. If fully conscious, drink 16 ounces of water. Call a physician or poison control immediately. Never get an un unconscious person. Anything to ingest. Good to know. And it's got, you know, I'm not going to bore you with this stuff. But I, I, I just think, I just want you to know that check this stuff out what do you have i know when i was growing up we had the mr yuck stickers we knew not to drink that nowadays it seems like for every type of chemical you'll find under a cabinet there is a a mountain dew or a sports drink that has that color too and um yeah someone could accidentally ingest i always get upset when i go into when i walk through a work environment and somebody's using a discarded gatorade bottle or um, Mountain Dew bottle for holding like a chemical. It's like, oh, I couldn't find a container, so I'll just, I'll, I'll finish drinking this and add to it. Are you a moron? I mean, if you left that sitting somewhere, somebody, you may even come back and drink it. You don't know. So I, yeah, I, you got to be careful with this stuff. You look for those things in the workplace. Every bottle that contains something needs to have a label for it, and you shouldn't be consuming uh, certain types of beverages out in the work environment where these, these other sorts of chemicals are used, especially when they're put into their own containers. 
that's all I want to cover this week or for this lecture. Um, I'll keep covering this in lecture 20.